But the big speech tonight will be the one by vice presidential candidate, uh, the vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance, one of the most radical people ever, ever to join a ticket, who made his first campaign appearance today. I was just so, so afraid for him and so afraid for our country. And then, of course, he stands up a minute later after they shot him. They literally shot him. Who is they exactly? Vance is best known for his best-selling memoir, Hillbilly Elegy, about a hard-scrabble childhood among the working-class white population in Appalachia and the American Rust Belt. In fact, I myself interviewed him about the book back in 2016, back when he was warning America about Trump. Take a listen. You will see how much of a 180 he's done since then. Because of the way that black Americans have been discriminated against legally, I think black Americans have tended to focus on a politics of, of race and which party is going to provide the most racial uplift or tear down the most legal barriers, whereas white Americans have typically voted um, their pocketbook, have voted uh, a politics of class. The white working class has gone from this constant economic optimism to the past 20 or 30 years, they've seen their prospects sort of fall off. So that pessimism creates a certain detachment from their country, a certain lack of faith in the future, and Donald Trump has obviously exploited that lack of faith. Well, they don't call him the shapeshifter for nothing. By 2020, the book was made into a movie starring Amy Adams and Glenn Close, directed by Oscar winner Ron Howard. It was the fiction that he sold America in order to burnish his national celebrity. You know, one that would get him invited on television to say things like this. I cannot stand Trump because I think he's a fraud. <laughs> well, I think he's a total fraud that is exploiting these I people who is a total fraud. Like you said, I, I agree with you on Trump because I don't think that he's the person. I, I, I don't think he actually cares about folks. At the heart of Trump's immigration message is that if we had less immigration, we would have much better jobs. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I, I, my, my own sense is that Trump definitely simplifies these problems. I mean, it's pretty clear that that version of Vance was just a means to an end. Like every other politician before him, he needed celebrity to become notorious. Let's be real. It was probably easier to sell the hillbilly version of his life than the story of a Yale law grad turned tech bro who locked arms with Peter Thiel, a dogmatic Trump supporting anti-immigration zealot born in Frankfurt, Germany, with deeply disturbing libertarian philosophies who thinks tech progress should be pursued with zero concern for the ramifications towards society. While at Yale Law School, Vance got to meet Thiel, who took a liking to him and helped him get a job in California. And like any good opportunist, Vance seized the moment and tapped into America's oligarchy, the Silicon Valley tech bros. He spent roughly six years working as a venture capitalist, but found common cause with people like Teal, Elon Musk, and David Sachs, another South African entrepreneur and venture capitalist who wrote a book with Teal, who have all championed his rise. These billionaires want their companies to pay less taxes than you do. They hate DEI. They don't like regulations on anything from artificial intelligence to cryptocurrency. And they definitely don't like unions protecting workers, which sort of helps you understand why Senator Vance quickly shed the hillbilly shtick and went with the radicalized, the radicalized vengeance filled Christian nationalism that champions mass layoffs in the civil service, forced births with no exceptions and a complete assault on democratic institutions. Should a woman be forced to carry a child to term after she has been the victim of incest or rape? We want women and young boys in the womb to have the right to life. I think two wrongs don't make a right. If we're unwilling to make companies that are taking the side of the left in the culture wars feel real economic pain, then we're not serious about winning the culture war. And so that is, that is challenge number one. I tend to think that we should seize the institutions of the left and turn them against the left, right? We need, we need like a de program uh, but like a de-wokeification program, we should just seize the administrative state for our own purposes. We should fire all of the people. That's quite a beard on that guy who was interviewing him. Let's bring in McKay Coppin, staff writer for The Atlantic and MSNBC contributor. McKay, uh, a lot has changed uh, beyond just um, adding the facial hair on J.D. Vance. He's made quite a trajectory. Good, though, I, have to say. <laughs> I know you're, 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 you're pro beard here uh, with, with the facial hair thing. But I mean, so, so talk about it for a second, because he really has become this sort of white Christian nationalist or Christian nationalist uh, that he wasn't when he wrote Hillbilly Elegy. Yeah, I mean, the problem with people like this who 
very suddenly and cynically transform themselves when they enter politics is that you always have to try to figure out which version of them was authentic, right? Like, was the version of J.D. Vance where he was making pretty clear-eyed and I think insightful points about the kind of fraudulent appeals that Donald Trump was making to the white working class, was that the real Vance? Or is this version who is now helping Trump make those fraudulent appeals? I don't know. Ultimately, what you know is that he, he can't really be trusted to stay consistent. He's an opportunist. He's a careerist. Uh, you know, I, I remember when I was writing my book about Mitt Romney, uh, you know, I would periodically ask him about various, you know, rising star Republicans. And when J.D. Vance came up, I, I had rarely seen Mitt Romney get more animated in talking about what kind of a sellout and, and a fraud he was. He said, it would be hard for me to disrespect somebody more than J.D. Vance. And I think that gives you a sense of, uh, of what a lot of kind of old guard Republicans who have interacted with him, and, and especially who got to know him in the hillbilly elegy days, uh, think of his his sudden MAGA makeover. Well, you know, I interviewed him before I'd actually read the book. Uh, and then as I read it, I realized that it was less a love letter uh, to the, 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 the white working class of Appalachia than kind of a diss track. Um, and, and I think right. that there was a, right? I, I think people were, would be surprised to know that that book was not, it, it was not very favorable toward those folks. It essentially accused them of just being, having lots of pathologies and go on, please. No, that, so that's in, that's the thing that I wanted to talk about because I do feel like so much of the conversation about him in recent days and recent weeks really has been about his flip-flopping on Trump. And I get why, you know, it's obviously indicative of a certain kind of political opportunism. But the more interesting transformation is the way he talks about the, the kind of working white poor, uh, that community that he came from. Hillbilly Elegy was a pretty withering critique in some ways of the culture of the community that he came from. And, it, you know, he, he had kind of a traditionally conservative attitude toward those communities. He said, you know, these people need to take responsibility for their lives. They need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And part of his critique of Trump and Trumpism was that Trump was exploiting these people by fanning the flames of white grievance, right? He, that, that was the point that he continually made on his book tour, that Trump is, uh, as he put it uh, in a piece that he wrote for The Atlantic back when he would write for places like The Atlantic, an opioid for the masses. That's how he saw Donald Trump in those days. Now, uh, you know, he has fully bought into uh, Trump's appeals to those people and has completely left them off the hook for all the things that he blamed them for in his book. And I think that ideological transformation is a lot more interesting than just he used to say mean things about Trump, and now he says nice things about it. McKay, Chinsaki, I wanted to ask, you had a really thoughtful piece um, today in The Atlantic that, that basically makes the point that when everybody says, which is from a good place, this is not a place for political violence, that politics is not a place for violence, that it's not actually true in this moment. If we look yeah. at trends over the last, not just few years, but even decades. And, and you use um, former Senator Jeff Flake as an example in there, which is really interesting. He is, of course, a former Republican senator, ambassador. Talk to us a little bit about what you think people don't understand about this moment and really where where political violence is in terms of the rise of it in this country and even in our political systems. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of uh, conversation since the shooting in Butler, Pennsylvania, about uh, this this alarming pattern of uh, violence targeting government officials, right, from Nancy Pelosi to Mike Pence to Brett Kavanaugh to, uh, you know, the congressional baseball shooting that Jeff Flake was there for. What I wanted to do with that piece was um, actually kind of look at it a little bit from the point of view of sitting political leaders, because something that has come up again and again in my interviews with uh, public servants, right, whether they're elected officials at the national level, federal level or local level, is that they are aware of these patterns. They are aware mm -hmm. of this phenomenon of political violence, this normalization of political violence. And it, they're living with that anxiety and fear in ways that are just deeply unhealthy for our political culture. I'll give you one example. Mitt Romney uh, once told me that uh, in the, the months after January 6th, as that second impeachment trial was taking place, um, and he talked to a number of Republicans in Congress 
who told him that they wanted to vote for Trump's conviction, but that they were afraid of violence uh, being targeted at them or their families. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't vote for his impeachment or conviction. And, and that is kind of a staggering reality that we're living in. Like, we, our, this experiment in American democracy does not work if our political leaders have to make their their calculations, their governing decisions based on a fear of violence from their own constituents. And I think that it's easy to not be sympathetic for politicians, obviously, especially if they belong to parties that we, we disagree with or we think are harming the country. But I think all of us need to realize that it is profoundly against the interest of American democracy if our, if our political leaders are, have in the back of their minds this fear ever lingering that somebody is going to try to kill them. That, that, that is just a, very, a symptom of a really broken political culture. A real stark reality. And, and when people are wondering where are a lot of these leaders, some of them, uh, to your point, you write about this in the piece, are fearful for their lives. Um, some people are still brave regardless, but it's such a good piece and interesting point. McKay Coppins, thank you as always for joining us. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.